Levi. Getting back, I don't know why you constantly put this thing here, because I'm not going to stay here. <laughs> all, all I know is nobody puts baby in the corner. Right? Where's your phone? Well, good evening again. I don't know if it's because, are they playing football again? They got football back and there. And volleyball. Over there. And basketball in the middle school. See, we're bringing them in. They think that they're playing games, okay? But we're talking about real life, reality. Uh, I noticed last night, I don't know if any of y'all did or not, but we were still going a little bit and some of them were leaving. But some of them were actually staying in their cars with their windows down. I don't know if any of y'all saw that or not, but I, sure I thought that was pretty. Yeah, they had a compliment of us saying from over. They, they were sitting in the car, did they? Their hearing aid batteries were probably dead, though. <laughs> I saw dogs running after me. No, that's <laughs> me is what it was. Was it? <laughs> Jeez. Pride comes before the fall, though, don't it? Jeez, Louise. Well. Good evening to Good evening tonight three. So the first night we discussed the greatest answer and the greatest question. We all remember what that was, right? The greatest question is Who do you say that I am? And the greatest answer that we will ever hear as human beings is you are mine. And then last night, we dug a little bit deeper into what it meant, why we are called His, and what we mean to Him uh, through the very importance of mankind that Jesus Christ, God Himself, would step out of all the glories of creation, or all the glories and splendors of heaven, all of His righteousness, and He would step into, this, into His own creation for you. Anybody remember that Hebrew word? You're close. It's Nashamacha. The very, his very breath, which gives us life. Just by the way, I want to let you know that so far tonight I've been told that I've, had, I've got bad breath. So I'm standing back here. <laughs> Thank you. I've already eaten one of them. Tonight, I want to jump in just a little bit deeper. We're all Christians here, right? Amen. Is everybody a Christian? Amen. Okay. I would ask if you showed hands, but I was, apparently I was too quiet last night, and some people forgot, or they couldn't hear me, so I'm trying to enunciate my voice. I'm trying to be expressive. I don't need it. I can't stand there. You know this, man. I see Ruger's back. He didn't bring me a Slim Jim, but he's here. And you know, I love seeing him here, right? I was watching you running after him, and I was sitting there encouraging him to keep it up. <laughs> Be well, seriously, because there's a lot worse things that a child his age could be doing right now. Amen. There's a lot funner things that he could be doing right now. He could be watching Spider-Man. He could be watching Paw Patrol. I don't know what they watch. I got five, and they range from 16 to 6, so they all watch different things, and it's, it's just weird. But it kind of leads into what I'm talking about this evening. And we'll be, we'll be going over one of the parables of Jesus, but I think it's very relevant for Ruger's age all the way up to Robbie's probably the oldest one here, so Robbie. No, he's not. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We'll be going through the parable of the ten virgins. And uh, I'm sure that most of you know it, and we're going to read it again, but I want to I want to look at it with some fresh eyes. Uh, I, I think in the in the Christian church especially, we don't focus as much on Christ's return as we should, right? And it's not going to be, I'm not going to be 
condemning the church or anything. I know that you've seen that meme on Facebook that says if Paul was here today and he wrote a letter to the church, all it would say is, y'all, we need to talk. We're not doing that tonight. But we are going to be talking about some hard stuff. So, um, some really deep stuff. So I, I just hope that you will accept it with, with love because that's where it's coming from is love. It's a place of love and not a place of condemnation. But I've got to say, I, I think we're missing the mark just a little bit. And you'll see tonight as we go through the scripture together. I started it Sunday and I'm going to keep it going. And, and I do it every time that I preach now and I, I really enjoy it. Who's got their Bibles? I didn't bring mine. I was at you got your phone? Yeah. No, I don't have a phone. Okay. There you go. All right. This is what? This is the Word of God. In it, and through its pages, we find hope. And once we discover this hope, that's where we find our light that will help us to walk through this darkness. But most importantly, by its author, we will find life. Well, let's open it together. So if you would please turn in or turn on your Bible to Matthew chapter 25. You know, all summer, and Jacob can attest to this, and so can Robbie, uh, I've been doing this fill-in preaching thing. Any church that needs somebody to preach to them on Sunday, and when they're really desperate, they will give me a call. Or they'll call the school and President Allen will call somebody like Jacob or Tanner or, or somebody else. But if they can't do it, then he calls me. Um, I don't know if I just back clean up, but yeah, I, I'm going regardless. I don't, don't ask for money, don't ask for anything. Um, but every now and again, I get to go back home, right? So I'm from Cynthiana, Kentucky, like I told you on Sunday. My wife's from Bourbon County, so that's a little bit east of here. Uh, it's about two hours from here. Huh? Well, good. I'm glad. You should come back. Maybe. You're going to lose an hour, but you can come back. Uh, and, and I got to go back a couple weeks ago because I've been preaching at a little, a little church in Mount Sterling. And uh, I got to go visit some people. I got to go visit my grandparents whom I haven't got to see since 2020 because they are, let's face it, they're old. They're a lot older than Robbie. It's just a couple years. And, uh, and, and, and I've seen them, and it's like, a, it's like we never missed a day, Right? I asked my grandfather, hey, how's the crops doing this year? Did you, did you put any tobacco out? And he said, no, I quit putting tobacco out um, a couple years ago. So I, it's at that moment I realized that 95 is the age you're allowed to retire from doing tobacco. Uh, but he still goes out every day, and he's still doing cattle, he's still doing hay, and it, it just lifted my heart because this man is the one that taught me my work ethic. This man is the one that I could just look at and just watch and I, I, I learn from. And they are faithful members of the, of the, the Stony Hill Baptist Church uh, in between Harrison and Pendleton County. They've been there their entire lives. And he didn't, he didn't come at me all the time and say, if you don't do this and you're going to hell and da 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 this, that, and the other. And, but he showed his... He showed his relationship. He taught me my relationship with Christ through his actions, which can be sometimes better than just uh, going through the scriptures and pointing out flaws. My grandmother, she's 93. Um, she, she retired a lot longer than Papa did because she said she just didn't want to work anymore. But uh, it, was a, it was a little sadder. She knew who I was but she couldn't remember my name. And it kind of hurt me as a grandson uh, for your grandmother to not remember your name. Um, 
but she got COVID a couple times, and I mean, she's better physically, but her mental state has just been in decline, and she's, she's gotten some dementia. She knew that she knew me. She knew that she loved me. She knew that she has fed me her entire life. Well, my entire life. But she just couldn't. It was on the tip of her tongue, but she didn't know who I was. And, uh, and then once it clicked, it was just an immense emotion. And her the same way, she taught me about Christian character and morale through not con go go just going through the scriptures, but actually living out the faith. And then I got to go see another woman who, after my mother passed away when I was 17, she kind of filled a void just a little bit. My mother was killed in a horrific workplace accident, actually the day that I got my senior pictures taken. And uh, it's a day that I'll never forget, but it's a day that I don't want to remember. And uh, it's my sister-in-law's mother. And I went and seen her because she's been in bad health lately. And, and my sister-in-law said, Michael, she just wants to talk to you. So I thought I was going to be a ministering spirit. And I would go down there, and I went and talked to her. And I said, uh, what are you doing, Betty? And she said, oh, just sitting here. I said, well, who, who's here with you? Because you're not supposed to be alone. She said, I'm not alone. She said, it's just me and Jesus. You see, she's developed some illness to where her liver and her, her liver and her kidneys are in battle with one another. So whatever they do for the kidneys counteracts and has an adverse effect on the liver and whatever they do to the liver counteracts has an adverse effect on the kidneys. So the doctor said, it's just a matter of time. This woman's supposed to be on a walker, but she has so much joy in Jesus. She says that she strengthened, that he strengthens her. And when the physical rehabilitation people come, they're like, Betty, you're supposed to have this walker out. And she's like, I don't need it. I get up, I do my own thing because Jesus wakes me up and strengthens me every day. And I know that as long as he keeps waking me up, then I'll be okay. But the day that he doesn't wake me up, he will wake me up, and I'll be even better because I'll be staring him face to face. And it was just, I thought I was going to be the one doing the ministering, but it, it was the reverse of that. And I, and I should have known it, I should have realized it because... She is just like my grandparents, and they, they have a faith that is lived out. It's not a faith that is just that, that just shows up on Sunday mornings and sits in their, in their seat, and they stand when they're told to, and they laugh at the preacher's jokes even when he's not funny, Robbie. And then they sit back down in their seats, and they will write their little checks, and they just go about their way, checking off boxes and, and doing this and doing that. It's a faith that's lived out. And it's evident. And so I wanted to tell you that. But Hebrews 11 tells us, I say it's Paul, okay? We'll just put that out there. Paul's the one that wrote Hebrews. I'm pretty sure Jesus has told me that. <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out one day. But he says, we're to run our race in such a way that we are to win, that we are to endure until the very end. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, that my grandparents and my sister-in-law's mother, they're winning. They're winning. And I can praise God for that. Before I begin tonight, I want to pray real quick us to uh, ask Holy Spirit to descend upon us yet again. It's been amazing these past couple nights, and I don't think tonight's going to be any different. <coughs> it's the first night you haven't asked me if I wanted the water. And it's actually the first night I don't got something to drink. Huh? Okay. 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 <laughs> so, if you don't care before we turn in, um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer just one more time. Father, we're... Uh, we're grateful. We're honored that you would uh, you would leave all of.
the glories and the splendors, all of the praise to descend into the darkness, just to shine your light so that we may be able to see, so that we may yet again be reconciled to you. Lord, I know that there's fewer people here, but that's okay. That's okay. Because each one of them told me last night, hey, I won't be there tomorrow, but I'll be there the last day. Lord, I'm, I'm praying that, that everyone here will, will be so full of you by the end of tonight that they will go out and even if <clears throat> someone rejects their offer to come with them, they're still doing your work and I pray that you would honor and bless them because we're only told to act, tell them about you. It's, it's up to them to accept that or not. So as we, as we nestle in and we dive into your scripture, Lord, I just pray that your authority will be your authority. It won't be the, the authority of man and his voice, but it will be your authority working through man as a vessel to proclaim your good news, to proclaim your worthiness. And until you return, Lord, may we scream, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, because in that day it will be a glorious day. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So we'll be starting in Matthew 25. We'll end in Matthew 25 as well. Are you serious? I took the hint. Took the hint. Oh, I thought he was leaving. <laughs> you know what I say? And I listen to y'all. Well, you can leave. I don't <laughs> Whatever. They're going to miss the good part of it anyway. All right. So we'll start in verse 1. We'll be, going, we'll be reading Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. The five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they didn't take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil. They took it in jars along with their lamps, and the bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they were all drowsy, and they all fell asleep. And at midnight a cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all of the virgins woke up. They trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going, are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were away to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. It's a beautiful parable. And Jesus uses this parable in such a way as to teach on the kingdom of heaven, how it operates and how it is a critical need to be ready for the return of the bridegroom. And if Robbie hasn't told you that bridegroom, that is King Jesus. He tells us, Jesus tells us in John 14, to not let our hearts be troubled, but believe in him. In his father's house there are many rooms, and he has gone away to prepare a place for us. Jesus says that if it were not so, he wouldn't have said so. But by teaching in this style, Jesus is telling his disciples and everyone that's listening to be alert, to be ready for his return. You see, Satan desires for all believers to be asleep. He desires for all of them to be drowsy spiritually so that they won't be ready. We see in these first five verses, we're introduced to Three different uh, things. First, we have the parable people in verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> verses 2 to 4, we see the players in this whole skit that's going on. And we have one, we have the foolish. These people weren't prepared for the arrival of the... You're the 
best. You see, the foolish weren't prepared for the arrival of the bridegroom. Would he beat you to it? You're just going to let me go dry. They didn't prepare for the additional need of oil. They thought that they had plenty. They go around saying, I'm rich. I have everything that I need and I've acquired wealth. I don't need anything. But they don't realize that they're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus says in Revelation 3, verse 17, because you're neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And we can read that on, on the surface and just look at it as face value and think, oh, well, he's just going to spit. And I don't know if Robbie's ever told you this, but the word used for spit in that is actually the word for vomit. It is a, well, everybody's vomited before, right? It's not just a simple, <laughs> right? I mean, it is gut-wrenching. It takes everything inside of you. I don't think that I have ever vomited before and I didn't sweat. I wasn't in angst. I wasn't buckled over. So it says that because you're neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, he will vomit you out of his mouth. And I think there's a lot of, of Christians who are sitting around and they're just lukewarm. I know that I've been lukewarm a long time. Well, I had been lukewarm for a long time. I like to say that I'm hot, but if I'm, if I'm honest, I'm still human, I'm still flesh. There's time that I can turn a little cold water on in my life. And it hurts. It's shocking. It may be, it may be warm, it may be cozy, but it's not what Jesus requires of us. But then you also have, on the flip side of that, you have the foolish, but now we see the wise. They're contrasted. These are individuals that were fully prepared for the arrival of the bridegroom. You see, they, they had prepared with an additional supply of oil. They didn't have to depend on others to fill their lamps. And it's easy for us as Christians to comfortably read this and think, huh, we're the wise ones. We are the wise ones because we have Jesus. We will be ready. We will be waiting the return of the bridegroom while those that have rejected Jesus are the foolish ones and have no hope whatsoever. Now, I need you to understand this, that as followers and believers in Jesus Christ, we do have a certain assurance of Christ, right? We do have this certain assurance uh, built within us that he is, he is going to return. And we have been clothed in his righteousness through our baptism. We have put on his image through our baptism. But I want you to see something here. This isn't a story of the wise and foolish virgins and not, what's, not virgins? I don't know. I've got a word for that, but I, Ruger's right there. I'm not going to use it. But they use the word virgin, right? The Greek is parthenos. It depicts purity. It marks not only the wise, but it, it marks the foolish as believers. We can sit and read this and say, we're, we're good. But this is talking about believers, not believers versus unbelievers. Jesus is talking about those that have been made pure through the salvation found only by his blood, that those that have been made pure by his atoning works on the cross. So therefore, these individuals in this parable, they're all believers of Jesus Christ. The entirety of all believers of all time broken down into two distinguishable groups. Those that will be ready or the wise and those that will be unready, the foolish. 
But a little bit more than that, after we find our players, we see the parable plan. Verses 6 through 7 tell us, be, be prepared. It says at midnight there was a cry, here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. And then all of them, foolish and wise, rose up and they trimmed their lamps. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 44, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Hmm. If we really look at our lives and we examine, I don't want to see a show of hands. This is something I want you to, I want you to sit on and I want you to marinate on this. Are you living your Christian life in such a way that you'll be ready in and out of season? Ready for the return of our King. Ready for the fulfillment of the promise that He is going to reconcile us to Himself. So verses 6 through 8 tell us to be prepared. But verse 8, it talks about the begging. You see, the foolish were begging, and they, they had to ask the wise to give them some of their oil. You see, they were completely dependent on the preparedness of others. It's been said that only 20 out of 100 people within the church do the entire work 100% of the time in the church. Think about that. What do we have? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 people here. That means of everyone here, and I'm not going to say who it is, only two people are doing the work of everybody here at this revival tonight. Can you believe that? 20 people do 20% do 100% of the work. I find that astonishing. You see, they, they, most individuals sit comfortably in their, their Christianity. They sit comfortably in their assurance. They sit comfortably knowing that Christ is Savior. And they completely negate Him and forget that He is our Lord. And it's sad to say that those statistics, and those, are, those statistics, they have been the same for years. I haven't checked them this year, but I bet you if I did, it's the same. You see, there's, there's personal accountability. We see that in verse 9. The wise told the foolish to go and buy oil for themselves. But, honestly, does that sound like a very Christian thing to say to someone? Especially someone who's trying to get to Jesus? Go get your own oil. I've got to go see the bridegroom. That's countercultural to everything that we've been taught our entire Christian lives. Why would you deny someone a little bit of yourself to go to help them to see Jesus. Brothers and sisters, understand this. No one can accept Christ for you. Each one of us must come to Christ on our own. Each one of us must be born again. Each one of us must be willing to know Christ as Savior, but know Him as Lord. And each one of us will be held personally responsible. It's reminiscent of the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, where Jesus said, unless man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of heaven. And it's probably one of the funniest stories in the Bible. I love it. I kind of like Nicodemus. And if you've ever watched The Chosen, I have decided to call him Nico because I feel like I personally know him now. But So Jesus says, unless a man be born again... He can't see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus says, how can you do this? 
Can a man go back into his mother's womb a second time and be born again? I can almost picture Jesus just kind of chuckling in his chuckling. And then he corrected uh, the assumption of Nicodemus by saying, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is born of spirit. You must be born again in the spirit. Nico, you're a, you're a high teacher in Jerusalem and you don't understand this? But make no mistake about it. We ourselves are personally responsible for our relationship with Jesus Christ and we must be ready at all times. We will hear the cry ring out in the night. The bridegroom is here. Get up and let's go see him. And even if we want to or not, we're going we're gonna to have to go see him. The sad part about it is some will be found within the church. Some will be found in need of oil. But the time to share that oil has come and gone. No, at, 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 that appointment, at that appointed time, no amount of our parents' faith, no amount of our grandparents' prayer or petition will matter. No longer will this invitation to sit in Christian Bible study or be in Christian fellowship, it will not be open. No longer will it be there a time for us to grow in this, our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Each one of us have a personal responsibility and we will be personally held accountable for the way that we have prepared for our own relationship with Jesus Christ. Is, is any of this sinking in? I mean, I, I really, I don't, I don't mean to harp on this. But you have the greatest thing. We, as Christians, have the greatest thing that has ever been, even greater than sliced bread. And we just haphazardly, especially in the United States, we haphazardly just have this little bitty relationship. It's kind of like uh, I've been married for 16 years. This 10 days from now will be our 16th wedding anniversary. So I've been out of the game, right? My wife said, you can't be a player no more. We gotta put down these roots. So I don't, I don't know what the dating scene looks like anymore, but I hear stories and it's, it's just, it's not really building a relationship. It's more of, you can make me happy tonight. And yeah, we'll probably go on a couple dates but I am not going to invest any real time with you. And I think that, that is, that's how so many individuals in the church respond to this blessedness of Christ. Hey, man, what's up? Already got water, so you're good. <laughs> you see... Brothers and sisters, the time is at hand that we must grow in this personal relationship with Christ. Many are still being nourished on spiritual milk. Even, hear me, even lifelong Christians that have been sitting in the church pew for years are still being nourished only by spiritual milk. It's time to, I'm not going to do it. I got something else I was going to say, but I'm not going to say it. It's time to get off the bottle, okay? If you've been a baby, you're a mother or a father, you know what I'm talking about. It's time to stop drinking this milk. But here's the beauty of it. If we go in and we eat the meat and the potatoes, you go to a restaurant, right? I went to Colton's yesterday. Robbie took me out. Had a, had a ribeye, had some shrimps. I had a salad and had some rolls and some fried pickles. Now, 
if that was all the Word of God, right? This succulent, medium rare slab of beef. If all you're doing is going through the doctrine, if all you're doing is going through here and you're getting fed by the Word and you forget to drink, you will find yourself caught up in legalism. I promise you. Because I've seen it. I have personally experienced it. It's, it's hard. At Louisville Bible College, and man, they are amazing up there. But... When we go to a class, it's really like it's really like an extra intensive Bible study. And we get nothing but meat and we get potatoes and we get fat and we get sassy and then we are energized to go out and do the same thing. But we've been so deep into our classes that we forget to take a drink sometimes. And we can get choked up. This milk, this nourishment, it's needed. That's the gospel. That's the pure love and grace of Jesus Christ. But the time is now that we switch to solid food. The solid food of God's word and we learn more about him and what he has done while still drinking of that milk. We see in verses 10 through 12 that there was a, an alternative to building this relationship with Christ. I'll call it the problem, the plea, and the punishment. You see in verse 10, we find the problem. The bridegroom came, the wise and the foolish, they both rose up, right? The wise and the foolish, they rose up. The, the wise and the foolish, they both trimmed their lamps. But the foolish realized that they didn't have enough oil. So they had to go away, right? Verse 10 says that the door was shut. And since the foolish weren't there, and the wise went with the bridegroom and they went into the wedding feast, the door was shut. You see, God gave the people in Noah's day ample time to prepare for an impending judgment. And just like the people in Noah's day, God is giving us ample time for His impending judgment. Peter writes in his second epistle that the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, but is patient toward you. He's patient toward me. God in His preeminence and, and mercy has granted us far more ample time to come to Him. Yet sadly, there is a day coming when this door of reconciliation will be closed. And I don't think we get that. I think we've been fed the, the love and the, the mercy of Christ, which we should, from the pulpit for far too long. Yeah. We don't give the full counsel, the full picture of God. Jesus is love and mercy. But he's just as much judgment and discipline to get the full picture. Proverbs 29.1 says, Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. That's why it's imperative that we do as Isaiah instructs in the 55th chapter of his book, to seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him while he is near. But there will be some that says, in verse 11 we find the plea. And those foolish, they come back and they see that the door was closed and they said, Lord, Lord, open up to us. Our parents, our friends, our, our co-workers, no one can open this door for us once it's been closed. Only Christ can open this door. 
Revelation 3 again tells us that the word of the Holy One, the true one, the one who is the key of David, who opens and no one can shut, who shuts and no one can open, knows us and sets before us an open door that will not, that no one will shut if we have kept his word and we have not denied him. He is the only one with the keys. And Jesus told us that he is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So we've got our problem. We've got our plea. And now we see the punishment. I don't know you. I don't know you. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then again in Matthew chapter 7, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, only those who are born again had, and have built their lives around him will gain entrance into the wedding feast. And the saddest words, the other night we talked about the greatest answer that anyone will ever hear in all of creation. Right now we're talking about the saddest words that will ever be heard by mankind is depart from me. I never knew you. The entire reason that Jesus left all of the indescribable glories of heaven and descended upon earth was in fact you. Don't shh him. He's getting into it. And you're letting yourself be taken out of it. Did you hear what I said? Don't blame it on you. Okay. Okay. I'll say it again. The saddest words that anyone of, any, of all of God's creation of mankind, the saddest words they will ever hear is depart from me. I never knew you. And it breaks me. It breaks me to know that I have brothers and sisters who have who have come alongside me. I'm sorry, I can't help it. I get expressive. But it, it saddens me to know that brothers and sisters in Christ who I have prayed with, who I have poured over the Word of God with, will hear Depart from me, because I never knew you. And the only reason that they will ever hear that is because they never knew him. Remember I said last night, was it last night or the night before, that my dad once said, "Some people say they know me, but only a few people know me. And it's the same with Christ. Jesus Christ came to reconcile God Almighty and His most perfect and precious creation. We learned that was us last night. Now we learn that some are going to be rejected by their Creator, not because it is His want or it is, it is His will for men to perish, his will is that all would come to repentance and a saving knowledge of Him based upon our level of preparedness for His return. We will be held accountable for all of eternity. We touched on this last night. We will live eternally. That question that we must ask is where will we spend this eternity? You see, I... I hear people talking about eternity only in the terms of heaven, but rarely do they mention it in the terms of the alternative. Hell. The very same hell as the Bible describes as weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, total darkness and flames and burning torment, everlasting punishment. Have you ever thought about that? Total darkness flames 
don't flame give off light? If we turned everything off here and I, I struck a lighter, you'd be able to see it. You know, the human eye can see the flicker of one candle from two miles away. Did you realize that? Our, our creator so sophisticatedly created our eye that we can spot light in total darkness, even the smallest fragment. And this is the God, the creator, who brings hope, light, and life to us. And yet some of us are blind to see it. These descriptions pale in comparison to what hell truly is. And yeah, I think I touched on this last night, but we're going to do it again because it's that important. I can live with my own inadequacies, right? My own failings. If I continue to grow, if I continue to learn, if I continue to accept correction when it is biblically sound, And I can do all this from Holy Spirit. But to live for all eternity, completely cut off from our Creator, that's what hell truly is. We said last night that it was, it's, it, it, it's the soul, the Maha, God's very breath in us that gives us this life that longs to be reconciled with its Creator. And no human being right now has ever experienced that. The total separation. But there is coming a day when that door will be shut and Jesus Christ will say, I never knew you. Yeah. And for the first time since the inception and creation of mankind, a soul will be totally irreconcilable with its creator. It, the, it will be cut apart. It will be severed. Give me the flames and the, the torment and the weeping and gnashing of teeth and the wailing, but do not let me be found without a connection with my creator. Because I can't handle it. That's what hell is. That's what hell is. And I shudder at the thought that anyone would have to experience this for all of eternity. Mm. That's why it's crucial that we are prepared. We found that in verse 13. It says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. But it begs the question, how do we prepare? Well, I think that we can prepare by watching, right? The wise and the foolish both went to sleep. And that's okay, because we're supposed to rest. But that somebody was watching. If nobody was watching, they would not be the alarm that says, get up! The bridegroom's coming. We should watch and we should develop our character. Christians should be God-fearing and humble and we should display the fruit of the Spirit given to us by Paul in Galatians 6. If you know them, no Bible college students, please. If you know them, say them with me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, and the hardest one of all, self-control. Mm. Jacob must he, he must struggle with that one because he was like oh brother <laughs> so my question to you are, are you developing good fruit or are you developing good or bad habits and I've, I, I've got to preface that by saying this don't get too down on yourself <clears throat> if it's taking longer for you than uh, it is another brother or sister in Christ, especially if it's somebody that you actually brought to the faith. And it seems like that they're doing more than you are. 
That's their journey. That's not yours. I want you to know that it takes a lifetime to build good, moral, Christian character. But understand this. I can't believe I'm saying this. Just like the giants, as long as you are moving forward, inch by inch, step by step, forward momentum, I don't care if it is a centimeter, you're developing good Christian character. It was kind of funny watching the Giants the other night, and I'm really not an NFL fan, but they got completely obliterated by the worst team in the NFL. And it was like the third, the third quarter, and uh, the announcer said, the Giants finally scored, and it's like, oh, that's the first time they've scored all season. And I'm like, whew, bro, how are you going to do that? But another way that we can prepare other than good Christian character is to watch our consecration. And I know that that's a big Christian easy word and we use it at the school, but what is consecrating ourselves to the Lord? It is a conscious, willing decision to dedicate our soul, our mind, our heart, and our bodies to God. Bear in mind that that is the number one commandment. The word used for that, we think of, we think of that as being four separate things, right? Our soul, our mind, our heart, and our body. But the Greek actually uses a word called cardia. It's where we get cardiac arrest, right? You're in the medical field. You know about that. The word used in the Greek for cardia, it's not just your heart. It's your entire being, your heart, your mind, your soul, your entire body, the entirety of you. And this decision must be one of will. It must be one of intelligence, intelligence, and it must be one of affection. And only you can make that decision to consecrate yourself before the Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, only two individuals were able to pass uh, that, were in, that were part of the Exodus. They were allowed to pass from Egypt. They were allowed to cross over into the Promised Land. I know y'all are perfect Christians. You know who it is, but Jacob doesn't. I'm trying to teach him. That was, those two individuals were Joshua and Caleb. You see, Joshua at this time was 60 years old, and Caleb was a ripe old 85 he really reminds me of my grandfather. I'm just going to be honest with you. The reason was because they were the only two that had brought back a not, a, not a good report, but a favorable report, not based on what they saw, but based upon who God is. When they went scouting in the land of Canaan, they believed that God would help them succeed. They went over there, all of the scouts went over there and they found luscious fruits and vegetables and lands flowing with milk and honey. And... But they were the only two that come back and said it looks pretty dim. But we can still do it because God is with us. They're the only ones that, be, that believed that God would help them succeed. And while everyone else was saying, turn back, Let's go back. Let's go another way. There's got to be a detour around here. These were the only two men that did not conform, but trusted God and what he said to be true. They fully consecrated themselves to the Lord. And in order to consecrate ourselves to the Lord, God wants full surrender. God wants full dedication. It doesn't mean you have to be different. God created you unique. You're going to keep your, your weird personalities. What other minister do you know hollers at people as they're driving down the road in the middle of a sermon? I'm just weird. But people find that great. Some people find it annoying. But I don't care because they annoy me. Paul tells us in Romans to present our bodies 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is spiritual worship, and not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds, that we may discern the will of God and know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And then finally, a good way to prepare is to watch your companions. My granny always said, show me who you hang with, and I'll tell you who you are. May I heard that? Amen. Absolutely. It's imperative that we know who our friends are. Bad company does corrupt good morals. And as Christians, we are to be known by none other than Jesus Christ, who lives in us, not by anyone or anything else. A bad friend will lead you into sin. They will encourage ungodly characteristics and they would rather see you fail than to do good in life. They want to see you succeed. They do. Because they can ride those, shirt, those skirt tails. They just don't want to see you doing better than they are. But that's not to say that we shouldn't share our Christian witness to them because Jesus Christ, he died, the same cross that he died on for us is the same cross that he died on for them. But sometimes you've got to know when your friendship with somebody else is leading you personally away from the Lord. And in that case, you've got, only got two choices. Right? You've got the wise and the foolish. Same thing here. The Bible's real simple to understand. Okay? If you see somebody leading you away from the Lord and getting you back into your flesh, you've got two choices. You can choose your friend or you can choose your Lord. It's that simple. And here's the beauty of our Lord. That, that answer is yours alone. No one can make that for you. Paul tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but to be separated from them. Did I say something? Preaching? Is he preaching back here? Choose Christian friends. Wise Christian friends who will build you up Friends that will hold you accountable. Friends that will correct you and they will help you. Friends that will walk alongside you even when you're walking through the mud and the muck and the mire. They will personally lift themselves or lower themselves into there to lift you out of this pit. That is a friend, brothers and sisters. We as Christians have so many, like, cliche sayings, right? Let's see. Can I think of one? Uh, God is great. How many of y'all thought in your head? All the time. And then I was supposed to say, all the time. Right? Is that not cheesy? I like it. It's true. But isn't it cheesy? Men's ministry is no different. That, that's really where I cut my teeth. That's really where I learned how to take my first steps into this walk with Christ. And, and, I, and I learned how to minister and, and become faithful to our Lord. Maybe that's kind of why I'm weird and I holler at people as they're going down the road because it's that important to me. But in men's ministry, there's this old... Don't get me wrong, it's scripture, but I, I just think it's outdated. It's just cliche. It's men, in men's ministry, the saying is, as iron sharpens iron, so is the accountants of a friend. Right? And it's true. But I think a far greater example of what true Christian fellowship is is found a few verses up in Proverbs 27.6. And it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Do you get that? Your friends will kiss you. 
your friends will lift you up and say, you are the greatest thing since American cheese. But a friend is going to tell you, you're the cheap kind of processed cheese. You're not really American right now. You won't make a good grilled cheese sandwich. Right? And they mean every word of it. And they will go back to the store, even though it's hurt, they've, they've had to tell you some hard truths. They will, they will go back to the store with you and they will help you get the right kind of cheese to make the perfect grilled cheese sandwich. Which I know how to make because my wife showed me how. So the question is, brothers and sisters, who are you walking with? When times get tough, when you don't feel like you're as close to God as you should be, are you, are you going back to your comfort? Are you becoming complacent again with your relationship with Christ? Going back into your old ways? Remember last night we said, today's complacency is what? Tomorrow's captivity. That is not original with me, but it's awesome. And I say it all the time. Who are you walking with? Again, you need to take that home. You need to marinate it. You feeling the spirit? What did he say? Tell me what he said. Fantastic. <laughs> faithful, are the, faithful are the wounds of a friend. <laughs> right? Bad Papa would have said, come on, baby, let's go. Right? <laughs> Who are you walking with? But one final question remains. Are you ready? Do you have enough oil? You see the oil in this parable, and I don't know if anybody's ever thought of this. The oil in this parable is symbolic of Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us to be filled with Him in Ephesians 5. Don't depend on what you did in the church in the days gone by of your youth by, by going downstairs and being with the kids and, and fixing something for the potluck and now you're, you're in your 70s or your 80s and you're like, I am done with this. I am out the pasture. I do not have to do any heavy lifting. I can just wait for Jesus Christ to return and I'll be good. It's not how it works. That is not how it works. You see, oil is consumed. Oil is burnt to light a lamp. Who remembers oil lamps? Okay, I, I, there's some young people here, so I'm going to give you an example. Do y'all drive? You drive? No? You ride though, right? All right. You go out with your friends? Got a full tank of gas, all right? Everything's copacetic. Everything's cool, calm, and collected. Right? Y'all listening? You didn't bring me no chicken, but that's okay. All right. What happens when you're riding around the car and you run out of gas? Why do you stop? Because you ain't got gas. It's the same principle with the oil lamp, right? You fill it with oil. You light it. I'm preaching up here, okay? It's no different than the fuel in our vehicles. So too, here's, here you go, so too the oil that we have will become spent while we are shining His light. Just because you are older now and you can't take them kids downstairs, that is the closest to hell you ever want to be, and it's, it's, it's there. Just because you don't feel like making your famous casserole for the potluck does not mean that you're done. Come alongside. Come alongside these young, the younger generation. Let them do the heavy lifting. You just teach them how. Give them that recipe 
that famous recipe that only you can make. So then, instead of that recipe dying with you, it can go on for generations. If you're good with kids, or you were good with kids, but you don't want to mess with them anymore, and I don't blame you, <coughs> give them the tips and the tricks to the younger generation. Well, why don't you try this? You know, when I was doing it, the kids really liked this. Why don't you try that? But come alongside of them and build the ones that are doing it now. Let them build the kingdom. You just oversee the project. That's generational faith that you can build into people. Mm. Don't get me started. I will be here all night. Don't expect the oil of someone else. Remember, 20% do 100% of the work in the church. Don't expect the oil from someone else to fill your lamp. Only you are able to have it replenished only by a daily walk with Christ. And each day we are to replenish. Each day we are to renew the oil that God provides. We must learn to walk in the Spirit. We must learn to pray in the Spirit. And we must learn to live daily in the Spirit. You see, it's, it's when Holy Spirit, only when Holy Spirit fills our lamp are we able and ready to shine brightly for the bridegroom's return. And maybe you're sitting here and you've never met the bridegroom that is to return. Some of you may be sitting here and you don't even have a lamp. I know these three don't. Some of you may be sitting here and you don't have a car. Is that better? Maybe you're sitting here and you want to know where you can get that lamp filled. Maybe you want to know where you can get a gas card. Okay? The only way that you're going to meet the bridegroom, the only way that you're going to get a lamp, the only way that you're going to get the oil to fill it is by knowing and having a personal relationship with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you can do just that Right here, right now. I don't know if there's anybody that hasn't been immersed into baptism into the Lord. I don't know if there's anybody here that hasn't been personally introduced to the Lord. But it can be done right here, right now. And if you have been immersed, if you have been <clears throat> living your life in such a way that you know Jesus Christ, but you know that deep down in the very pit of your cardia, your whole self, that you haven't been living it right. Last night we said that that's shame. And just like last night, it's time that we are to not be hidden from our Lord. It's not. It's not. What's the word I'm looking for? It's not a bad thing that you would want to come back to your Lord. Nobody's going to make fun of you. Nobody's going to say one thing to you. If they do, I'll put them in the car with the people that were driving down the road. Because we ain't got no, ain't nobody got time for that. We've fought amongst ourselves for too long and we can't do it anymore. You can do that today, right now. Somebody's coming to revival, we're going to start again. Christ came because he wanted you to understand that he loves you. He came that you may be reconciled with your Creator. And we know that we were separated from God by our sin. And only Jesus Christ paid the price for the atonement of that sin. Hmm. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And whether we want to admit it or not, we know that we are guilty of doing wrong. We can't honestly pretend to justify our good nature or ourselves to say that we are good people. So what can we do about it? We've got to compare ourselves. We've got to compare our, our identities only to Jesus Christ himself. The one that never violated the law. 
the one that died so that all of our sins could be forgiven. He is faithful. And He will give you that victory over death. He will, amen, He will give you the lamp because He is the lamp. He will give you the oil because He is the oil. And He will give you the light because He is the light. We try to make the gospel out to be something that it's not. We want to overcomplicate it. So I'm going to tell you exactly what the gospel is. I want to take my jacket off, but i got this mic in here. Jesus Christ came. He died on a cross for our sin. He arose on the third day and He ascended. And the greatest part of it is He's coming back. That's the gospel. I could have said that and we could have been out of here an hour ago. Wouldn't even have to listen to Levi singing. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. One day we will hear, get up, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. Because one day he will return. And the only thing, the only thing that I care about is are you ready? If you are, great. Help someone else prepare. If you're not, find someone that is ready and let them teach you. Let them build up in you. If you know that, that you're not doing it right and, and, and you just need somebody to come alongside of you, I ask that you come. Steve's here, Robbie's here, Levi's here, Jacob's here. Let us talk with you. Let's pray about this situation. Let's pull you back. You may not like what you hear all of the time, but I can promise you that faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's, I'm tired of this patty cake Christianity, this cookie cutter model of what Christianity should be because that's not what the Bible says. So I beg you, I implore you to come today. Pray with me, Father. You're righteous and true and the only one deserving of all honor and glory. Lord, may we be ready. There are some that need to have a lamp. There are some that need to have their oil replenished because, Father, forbid it, that you would return and they are found not without enough oil. And the time for that sharing of oil and that building up of oil is gone. And one day you will shut that door. Let it not be, Lord. Let everyone come to a saving knowledge of you even after they've accepted you. Let them know that the work's not done until you return. We must fill our oil. We must shine your light into the darkness. Father, I pray that each man, each woman, especially Ruger, will be a lamppost shining brightly your light into this fog, into, your dar into this darkness as they go out about their way. Father, I pray that you will, you will lead them home tonight and they will sit and they will marinate on what this word was tonight of your authority. And may they come back refreshed and renewed, oil, full, light, burning, so bright that we can just turn these lights off and just experience you. Be with us as we go about our, our way, as we go about our day tomorrow, and as we return until we can once again come together. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.